He is risen. He is risen indeed. If you can't hear me, we'll say it a little louder. He is risen. He is risen indeed. If you can't hear me, I'll say it a little louder. You've heard those uh, words spoken. I probably, when I was a pastor, spoke them myself. Uh, probably engaged in this kind of call and response. As if shouting the words louder somehow made them truer. Or at least truer for me or for the congregation. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, after the women were angelically informed uh, of Jesus' resurrection, you would think they would have run out of the open door of the tomb, shouting, he is risen, so that the hiding disciples, wherever they were, could hear it. So the world would hear it. But no, as Brad, our pastor, pointed out on Sunday morning, uh, instead, here are Mark's last words of his gospel. So they went, the women, so they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. If you find that puzzling, that kind of response by the women to this really good news, say it a little louder, then you're in good company, for there are many scholars who also find it puzzling. But it makes you stop and reflect on a cheerleader shout like that, he is risen, he is risen indeed, of what it does or doesn't accomplish. Another problem for me is I don't think the majority of people in the pew even know what he is risen means or stands for. So today, with the help of the four Gospels, I would like to better understand he is risen. Indeed, 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 supposes the absence of doubt. Remember, we think this Gospel of Mark, which we've been studying now, for nine months or so, uh, was written around 70 A.D. The writer was not a disciple, but based his text on some oral tradition from his community, probably. Also remember that the later Gospels, Matthew and Luke and John, build upon, especially Matthew and Luke, build upon Mark's basic message. Turn uh, with me to that final chapter 16 in Mark, and let's read it out loud together. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to themselves, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised from the dead. He is not here. Look, there is the place where his body laid. And go tell his disciples and Peter, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him, 
just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And then, surprise, in your Bible there should be two more endings, two endings that came, that were written maybe a hundred years later by someone else in some religious community because they had the impression that Mark may have lost his own ending and they wanted a happy ending. They wanted uh, some sightings of Jesus. They wanted Jesus to tell them why all this was going on. So they appended, so that even in our Bibles today, those two later endings were attached. If you read them through, they don't really sound like Mark. They sound like someone else trying to put a cap on it. And if your text, if your text of Mark includes them as part of the text, you probably should go out and get a reliable Bible. In the 16th chapter, Mark tells of the women, especially Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and Salome, who went to the tomb to anoint the body with spices. That is, to put spices between the folds of the shroud wrapping the body to offset the odor of decaying flesh. Then after a year or so, the tradition was, after the flesh had completely decayed, the bones were often put in a smaller stone box called an os ossuary, and, and they stayed there, perhaps in a tomb with other bones. The first woman named is, in all the Gospels, is Mary Magdalene. As if to subtly remind us, without going too far, that she had a special relationship with Jesus. Somewhere between, as you remember our discussion, somewhere between agape and human love some dimension of that because she is named in every single gospel as the first person that Jesus appeared to or that went to the tomb. That's got to be important. Uh, when the women enter the open tomb, they find an angel. Now, this angel is clothed in white in Matthew it's dazzling white. Well, those things have a progression, you know. Uh, make it a little more special. But anyway, it's nice to have an angel or two around to, to help explain the unexplainable. He says to the women, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him. Some suggest that the angel meant go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning of his ministry in Galilee and remember all the extraordinary things that he did. All the wonderful, loving words that he spoke. The happy trajectory of his kingdom come ministry. And if you do that, you'll see him or experience him. 2,000 years later, that same angel is talking to us. Go back to the beginning of his ministry with the baptism by John and, and, and look again at everything that's accounted of his life. And then you'll see him. 
We Sunday school and confirmation Lutherans bring a certain what's called a pre-understanding of Easter. This pre-understanding was taught to us in childhood and over the years has been affirmed by preaching and teaching hymns and liturgy. In this pre-understanding, all of the Easter stories, the four Gospels, are joined together in a composite, single story. The pre-understanding also assumes the factuality of each appearance, of each story. Insistence on historical factuality, as if we could photograph his risenness, did it really happen? Our, we are bent in the direction of, the, of wanting to have the facts. It gets in the way of a more important question, and that is, what did it mean? That's, that's the underlying question we ought to be dealing with. Not, did it happen? Really happen? Or, what does it mean? What do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, many others, what are they telling us? So with that question on our lips, what do you mean? Let's travel now to the truth beyond the facts. First, Matthew. Matthew was written 20 years later than Mark, around 20 years later. And he also tells of the women going to the tomb, but he alone reports that there were guards at the tomb because they were afraid that Jesus' friends would come and take him and say he was, he was risen. And as these guards were around the tomb, all of a sudden there's an angelic grand opening, an angelic earthquake. And the, the stone door was rolled back, and the guards made haste to get out of there and go to the high priest or the high scribes and to say, look what happened. And they agreed, after being paid off, that, that they would never tell anyone. So Matthew adds that little story. For what reason, we're unsure. It's the only one like it in the Gospels. But take it the way he says it. Like Mark in Matthew, the disciples are told to go to Galilee where they will see him. But in Matthew, you're going to see him on a mountain. That's one of Matthew's favorite sites, a mountain. Why? Well, Matthew begins his accounts of Jesus with stories that compare him to Moses, to Elijah, to, uh, to David. And uh, that, that's why Matthew wants to put him and the disciples on a mountain. And there he gives the disciples a benediction, a command and a promise. I am with you always to the end of the age before leaving them. Twenty years later, around 110 A.C.E. or A.D., Luke's gospel emerges, coming probably from another tradition in some other part of the Mediterranean world. Seventy percent of Luke's gospel is based on Mark, but his resurrection stories, like Matthew, are unique and rather beautiful like his birth stories, like his nativity stories, which we love every Christmas. Well, he has that gift, that poetic gift, to tell of something happening around Jerusalem, where the crucifixion took place, where the body was buried, not Galilee. 
where two grieving uh, followers of Jesus start to walk home to the village of Emmaus. A stranger joins them, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains why Jesus had to die. As these two followers who had been walking along before the stranger met them, as they began to go on the exit ramp to to Emmaus, this strange stranger appeared to be going farther. And that's a provocative sermon. You have to invite him in. He appeared to be going farther. The three men by the Oaks of Mamre, Abraham insisted they come for dinner. And if he hadn't, maybe there would be no Sarah giving birth to a nation. At dinner, he, oh, they say to him a famous line, uh, which is in some of our liturgies, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Stay with us. That would be a nice prayer around dusk for all of us. Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. At dinner, the stranger takes bread, like he was the host, takes bread, blesses it, broke it, blessed, blessed it, and gave it, to the, gave it to those two. In that moment, the account says their eyes were opened. Well, yes. Their eyes were opened because they had seen him do that many times. Seen him with the crowds of four or five thousand and we have seen him every Sunday, in a sense, breaking, blessing, and sharing. Did Emmaus, that story, ever really happen? It's full of underlying meanings, of, of metaphorical meanings. You miss the wonderful messages in this story and others, if you're hung up on why didn't they recognize him, or who are these two followers? Here and in later verses, Luke has Jesus saying, this is what I've been telling you, that everything written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled first. That's like going back to Galilee. That's like finding your way, following him all over again, isn't it? That was his way of fulfilling the law and the prophets. We live that every Sunday in our communion service, as I just said. Later in Luke, Jesus appears to the disciples and offers them the same physical proof that Thomas needed later in John's gospel. Put your hand here. Feel the wound in my side. And then there's John. John, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. John gives us one of the loveliest stories of all. Finding the tomb empty, Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, sat weeping in Joseph's lovely garden. Eventually, a stranger, she assumes is the gardener, lovingly calls her name. And then she knows who is speaking to her. In this story, Jesus says, don't hold me yet, implying he was not completed his mysterious transition between death and life. He's on the way to the Father, but will appear later to his disciples. Don't hold me yet. Now, I don't want to make something out of nothing, but if that doesn't say that Mary Magdalene and Jesus I'm not trying to Dan Brown you, that M Mary Magdalene and Jesus 
had something special. Maybe as a disciple. Maybe she was really the first disciple. We don't know that. Well, finally, we have to take into consideration Paul. Because some of his letters were written before the Gospels. Like in 50, 55 A.C.E. And Paul lists all the number of Jesus' sightings, including his vision and what he heard in that vision on the Damascus Road. Nobody else in his company heard anything. He lumps them all together. Jesus appearing to Peter. Jesus appearing to his brother James. Paul himself, all in different guises and ways. Once, he says, Jesus appeared before 500 brothers and sisters at one time. All the appearances are different. Walking through doors, a half-done apparition, apparition uh, to Mary Magdalene on a mountain in Galilee, eating fish on a beach, physically inviting Thomas to touch him, and a vision on the Damascus Road, seen and heard only by Paul. Maybe, maybe as these evangelists strain to assure us that Jesus was raised by God, maybe they're talking about a sense of presence uh, rather than appearances. I don't know that. It's a guess. Many and many of these beautiful stories refer to what could be considered feeling his presence, seeing him. Maybe that's what the word means to them, seeing him. But I don't know. I don't want to take anything away from the Gospels or you. But take that into consideration. When my father died, tragically, the next week, my mother had a vision of her husband standing at the foot of the bed. She felt it wasn't the same thing as a dream or even a, a daydream, but that somehow, some way beyond her understanding, he was there. Presence. A sense of presence so strong that a loved one is convinced they see him or her, that they heard them, even touched them. These are phenomena that you might be able to document in your own life. She felt that it wasn't the same thing as a dream, but that somehow beyond her understanding, he was there. Present. So if you had to choose, at this point, if you had to choose which gospel is your favorite Easter story, now we've gone through all of them, including Paul, in 1 Corinthians, by the way, that's where he lists those resurrection appearances. If you had to choose one of them, what would it be? Think about it a minute. Each one of them is quite different. Jesus is quite different in each one. Eating fish on the beach, you know, not yet resurrected in front of Mary. All of them distinctly different. They don't fit together. Some say in Galilee, some say in, in Jerusalem. There are stories connected with all of them the guards, the travelers to Emmaus. So if you had to choose, which one do you like best? For me, hands down, it's Mark's ending. Mark's open door. As if Jesus, with God's blessing, has been let loose in the world. God's yes resounding to the ends of the world and the ends of the universe because of that open door. He's been let loose. And that means you don't have to choose between all those sightings in the other Gospels. 
No matter how different the stories, they're all true. True for this group, true for that group, true here and true there. Was he a vision? Was he a dream? A bereavement hallucination? Was it in Galilee or Jerusalem, in the upper room, or on the beach, or on the mountain? Were there one or two angels? Yes to all of that and every other version. That's why I love Mark. He lets the open door stand for everything, everything you can name. And the, the great thing about Mark's ending is this. Jesus is not taken away from us into heaven. He never left. He never left. No, I know in one of those endings, it's, it talks about him being ascended. And in some of the other stories, that's the same thing. That's so he can come back on Pentecost or whatever, the spirit of Jesus. Uh, but Mark doesn't, doesn't put it that way. He permits us to think that Jesus is always there. He never left. He is there when the homeless are fed. He is there when nurses help people and give them vaccinations. There, in a mother or father's loving acts with their children. There, when the rich, rarely, pour out their riches on nations of starving people. And I could go on and on and on. But he's there with each one. He said he was going to be. And Mark's open door is not a shut door, it's an open one so that we can experience his resurrection in our lives. Would we want to really confine it to the first century? Oh, God. That wouldn't be fair, God. To confine all of this almost unbelievable miracles that happen with his resurrection, if it was all confined to one little neat package, that doesn't sound the way God works. But you're the one that has to choose. He is always, always in some other guise in our lives. The Jesus life is about caring and healing and saving others we may not recognize him just because we weren't looking for him. Like the two guys going to Emmaus. We didn't recognize the stranger because we didn't think it was going to be Jesus. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to recognize him. We should just believe that the resurrection happened early in the first century that would be such a limiting factor. God's dream is coming true all the time. His presence, not then and there, but here and now. If it's the same old question that the angel asked, why do you search the living among the dead? For me, uh, I have discovered in this nine months of what we've been doing together on Mark, really gifts, blessings every single month that I never thought of before. But they have, they have effectively broadened my horizon, confirmed my faith, or maybe a new faith, and given me certainty about things that I had wondered about. So maybe, maybe, I hope you have discovered as well, 
the life-changing and life-affirming good news once again. Maybe we can now say together with more confidence, he is risen indeed. Indeed.